Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I'm interviewing Lynn Morose. She took me up on my offer to interview podcast listeners on their amazing life stories and all of their stories of defying aging. And boy, Lynn has quite a story. She has had three traumatic brain injuries. She's working on managing atypical ductal hyperplasia in the breast, but She's not boring, she's not routine, and she's not uninspiring, that is for sure. Because throughout her life, she's held positions high up, like vice president, senior vice president in advertising positions, and she's managed to find time to drive Formula One race cars for fun, to ski, which is her big hobby, and not only that, cycle, swim, and really even get down to playing tennis. She's fascinating. I love all of her her thought processes on life and her mission. And really, she's just learning to make lifestyle changes to help reduce stress and inflammation over time with her traumatic brain injuries, but also as she's getting older. She's working on mindfulness. She's working on meditation. And she really does believe that you've got to keep trying new things as you get older. And Gosh, she's an inspiration. She's got a great story, and I can't wait for you guys to meet Lynn. So let's get on with the podcast. Hey, Health Junkies. I have Lynn Moroz on, and we are going to be talking about getting older, overcoming obstacles, and really just having fun with new adventures as life life moves on. So Lynn, welcome to the Health Fix Podcast. Hello. Thank you. It's great to be here. My pleasure. I when you pitched to to come on, I was like, yes, let's talk because you have so many things that are are not uncommon for a lot of folks to to have experienced, but also you've got this underlying adventure. At like every decade, you are doing something different that that I I find absolutely cool. And so many you've done so many things that I haven't done. So I'm like, I I have things now on my new bucket list that keeps changing every single day. And of course, when I bring people on, then I always want to talk about in terms of getting older, when you were, say, five, six, that kind of age range, what age did you think folks were kind of old? What was what was in your mind when you started looking at grandparents and, and their behaviors? What kind of had in your mind like, oh, they're old and, and that misconception of what getting older really is? Well, that's an interesting um, question because for some people like my teachers, I thought they were really old. Mm-hmm. Um, I went to a Catholic school in Detroit and um, and then moved to the suburbs. And so I had a mix of private and public school. And so some of the teachers to me seemed really, really old. But my immediate family, they didn't act that way. My grandparents were all very active. My um, parents were very active. My uh, grandparents on my dad's side skied um, into their 60s and 70s. Um, they had a cottage. And so, you know, they would take us out boating, sailing, we water skied. Um, um, and so I just kind of had this uh, juxtaposition of, you don't really have to be old, act old, you can, you know, have fun and enjoy life. And um, every weekend, when I was very in elementary school, we would either go to my parent, my grandparents' cottage in um, northern Michigan, and um, it was just fun. It was we went, you know, mini biking, water skiing, boating, swimming every day. It was a fantastic childhood and a great way to get out of the city of Detroit. You know, when it would be very hot, and um, and then. Um, in the winter, we would we started first we skied locally in the Detroit area on some local hills. And then I think around the age of seven, um, well, actually, there's pictures of me stomping around our backyard in Detroit mm-hmm. with <laughs> skis on. But mm-hmm. when I was seven, I think it was we started going up north on a fairly regular basis in skiing. And um, my dad made friends with an Austrian ski instructor who missed her. Ooh. Um, yeah, Ushi, her name was Ushi. She missed her family at home. 
took me under her wing and she, you know, you just, you went where she went and she yelled back, bends your knees, bends your knees. <laughs> <laughs> but she would take me in the lodge and get hot chocolate. And, um, you know, and then I went from there, uh, started getting involved in ski racing and a friend of mine, uh, his name is Todd. We, at eight years old, we begged the, the lift operator to let us get the, the gates out and we <laughs> set our own courses on the hills and, and then that led to um, starting within what's called the CUSA, which is the Central United States Ski Association, the Midwestern Division. And I think I was around eight years old and I was in the elite division of CUSA. Oh, wow. So, you know, and with that, you know, my parents were there and they were skiing and, you know, I don't know, we just... Um, we didn't have that. My grandparents uh, on both sides lived until their 80s. Right now, our aunt, my mom's sister, she's 98. Wow. Still lives alone. Um, doesn't like to hear you're getting old, so things may have to change. <laughs> <laughs> and um, my dad, he, um, he was still playing golf three times a week into, uh, when he was 90. Wow. And wow. um, he won tournaments at his the clubs, not for his age group and not from the advanced tees. He <laughs> would, you know, <laughs> yeah. So that was my role model. I remember my dad telling me, you know, Lynn, you have a choice when you wake up in the morning. You can wake up and be grateful and, you know, another day to do what you want to do. Or um, you can complain about every ache and pain you have in your body. And trust me, when you get into your 80s, <laughs> you have a lot. But he goes, people don't want to hear it. And you know what? For your mindset, in order to be positive, you should, you know, you can acknowledge it, but you don't focus on it. That's huge. That's yeah. huge. You know, I think a lot of folks don't have that kind of positive, positive message or also role mm -hmm. models like you had of everybody being active. A lot of folks, unfortunately, have folks who kind of, their, their parents might be like, well, I'm getting older, I'm just gonna quit, or I'm just gonna, you know, give up or oh, I am getting older, so I can't do x, y or z. Now, of course, you definitely have have defied that because I was looking like in your 40s, you drove a Formula One race car. Mm -hmm. Most people once we get to our 40s, and, and I'm in my mid 40s now, I've like been like, and, and it's crazy. And, and I, I'm curious if this happens to you, where even maybe before, maybe not so much now, where in the back of the, your mind, you're like, I might be too old to do this. Do you ever think that? Or did you ever think that? I do think that for bungee jumping. <laughs> <laughs> as much as I'd love to do it, I have a fear of heights. Um, so that's like one thing where I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> but mm -hmm. no, nothing else, nothing else. I, um, you know, and I think both my parents instilled it. And my dad definitely... For sure. I mean, when I was about five years old, um, he had me uh, what they would call wakeboarding back then behind an aluminum fishing boat. <laughs> <laughs> that you, I, Michigan, that's a thing in Michigan and Wisconsin, guys. It right. is a thing. Yeah. 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 And then I advanced and, you know, kept going. But um, no, I, I don't. I don't have that approach. It's when we moved to Austin in 2014, I met a woman who was a fitness director. Her name is Jackie and super positive. And I was taking her classes, like her spin classes and her uh, kickboxing classes. So she comes up to me one day and she says, Hey, Lynn, you want to do a marathon? And I'm mm -hmm. like, do I look like I do a marathon? And she goes, Oh yeah. So anyway, fast forward, we go down to San Antonio and then in the morning when, you know, we have the bike and we have everything all set up, I'm like looking around. I go, well, there seems to be like a pattern here, like a setup or something. Jackie, what am I supposed to do? And she goes, wait a minute. Have you never done this? And I go, I told you I had never done it. And mm -hmm. she goes, well, don't worry. It's a, it's a, um, everything's shorter. You know, the swim is shorter. The bike ride is shorter. It's like 12 miles. I go, oh, 12 miles. I can do that. The run is only a couple of miles. So then we get in there and there's people all ages. It was women. I think mostly at that event. And my competitiveness kicks in. So I'm trying to go fast. I find out it's a sprint triathlon. 
<laughs> she failed to mention that, but she still, she couldn't believe that I had never, you know, done it before. And I, and you just showed up. There was no training yeah. at all. No, we didn't know. Tra- I mean, it was her <laughs> spin class. And <laughs> so I didn't know, like, for the, you know, you're supposed to position your helmet this way so you can jump on the bike and, you know, you, you want to wear this, these kind of clothes. No. Oh, that's hilarious. That's hilarious. But the fact that you just jumped up and you were ready to do it, I think for Mm -hmm. a lot of people, you know, 5Ks, people train for 5Ks, you -hmm. know? And so just looking at a triathlon where there's three individual things, she just saw you in spinning and she's like, let's (laughs) do this. I mean, that's huge. That's huge. How, how young were you when you did that one? I think I was 56. Somewhere in there. Yeah. Holy cow. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, yeah, those are things, too, that folks even in their 20s will train for. So I think a lot of people are like, dang, you must be superhuman. Of course, I love to explain that you do not have to be superhuman to, no. to do these sorts of things. Now, you were telling me earlier that you and your husband have a tandem bike. And that we you do. Ride. When did you guys start riding around in the tandem bike? So my husband, John, he has been active similarly. You know, he uh, used to run a lot in college and do the uh, 10K races. And then at some point he had to switch. I think he was having some hip issues and they suggested biking. So then he became, and he's like a rocket ship on his bike. I mean, he just passed me. Um, and when our youngest was around six, he went out and bought a tandem bike. And I mean, I was with him, but he said, let's go check out the bikes. Let's get a tandem bike. We can start doing rides together. And um, it was funny because the owner of the, and it was a continental bike shop in, in uh, outside of Detroit said, when we got on the bike, he said, he, we came back and he goes, do you guys have a good marriage? And I'm like, well, <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? And he goes, I think you have a really good marriage because you just got on like, and you were gone, like no arguing, nothing. And I guess that doesn't happen for some people that pick out the tandems. But um, anyway, so we got a tandem. And of course, the first thing we decided to do is to train for a four day bike tour from that basically starts at Michigan State in the middle of Michigan and goes on a northwest route. And then you end up at the Mackinac Bridge. Oh, I love the Mackinac yeah. Bridge. Yeah. And um you can sign up. It's usually like 80 to 100 miles a day. And um, the one we did, the Quad Century, we, we got about 40 miles, I think, from the bridge. You have to go through this area called the Tunnel of Trees, which is gorgeous, and um, up by Harbor Springs, Michigan. And um, my uh, my uh, hamstring some must have had a small tear in it or something. I don't know. It started hurting really bad. Oh, no. So I got up, we got off and they they do a great job with this ride. They have support people everywhere. I got off and I had tears coming down my eyes and like, oh, the bridge, it's so close. I really want to finish. And, but I just thought, oh my gosh, this hurts. So one of the paramedics brought over a big bag of ice <laughs> and my husband said, we can stop. We don't have to keep going. I go, no, we're going to that bridge. And so I asked the paramedic for duct tape <laughs> and I duct tape a bag of ice to my leg. <laughs> and then oh. I put on Stevie Ray Vaughan and just got there. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, of course, would have been like, yep, I'm done. I'm done. But, you know, mm-hmm. of course, you had mentioned earlier before we hit record that you've got quite a bit of a history of sports and ski, you know, mm-hmm. ski racing, of course, too. And I, I think there is a little level of like, we will push ourselves a mm-hmm. little bit harder. We'll challenge ourselves a little bit harder. Sounds like you, you were rocking out and had some drive. Oh yeah. That, yeah. Get Stevie that took me home <laughs> across the finish line, tears coming down, you know, <laughs> that's everything hurt, but oh, um, my goodness. yeah, mind over matter, you know? Absolutely. And I think that probably started at a young age because I remember my mom saying, I would say, I can do it. I can do it. Um, my dad taking me skiing for the first time when I was about five years old. And I took off, I didn't wait for him to buckle his boots. I just took off <laughs> <laughs> and I crashed, but I, I came up, I was smiling and laughing. And then um, he gave me um, a tennis racket. Back then they were wood. 
Okay. And um, we went out, we hit balls. I used to practice against our house in Detroit. And um, I'll never, I remember, I think I was holding on to it when Billie Jean King oh, did yeah. her famous tennis match. And I was just like cradling the racket, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, if you can do it, I can do it. And um, so, yeah, it's just, um, I have had challenges because I've had injuries and things like that. But, um, and I think more now it's knowing um, it's okay to kind of set a limit on yourself. You don't want to diminish yourself, but you might say, okay, I'm not going to do the hit classes now. I'm going to do other things. And I think even more important now as I get older is like um, I used to do yoga a lot, but like yoga, stretching, um, mindfulness, all of that is just as important. Um, whereas before it was leave work, go to the gym, run, you know, as fast mm -hmm. as I could on the treadmill, <laughs> get home. And um, now I think it's more important to have kind of like a 360 view of health. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's and it's one of those things that as we get older, we start to kind of go, sh you know, we do have that dialogue, even myself in my head, I'll have that dialogue of like, how much should I do of hit? Or how much should I do of this? When should I do it? You know, am I getting older? Maybe I shouldn't, you know, not am I getting older, but it's more of a question of am I too old for this kind of thing in terms of how how do I juggle this? And I think one of the most important things you kind of mentioned there was with with family, I'm going to work, then I'm going running as fast as I can on terminal. So a lot of women juggle right? Mm -hmm. Taking care of their family, taking care of their parents too mm -hmm. at this age. How how do you juggle everything? You're saying taking a 360 view. Give us the scoop of how how you juggled things as your kids were getting older. And, and as now, I'm sure you've probably had some instances in which you're watching over parents and things of that nature. Give us the scoop mm -hmm. a little bit about how that played out for you. Yeah. Well, when our our children were young, we, I would take them to different babysitters, uh, sometimes family members, um, sometimes like private, you know, places. Um, and then we were fortunate when our youngest was, um, like around kindergarten age, we found a woman, a young woman and she, her name is Lisa. She was fantastic. She became part of our family. Um, and, but I really did try I usually had a kind of a long commute and I really did try like once I got home, that was it. You know, mm -hmm. I could focus on the kids. Um, and then when the kids were older, we had some uh, high school help, um, students that helped us and we were still in touch with all of them. Um, one's named Bonnie and another one's um, Liz. And, um, you know, our kids were in their weddings and stuff like that. And, nice. um, you know, I did really make an effort to be there as a mom, even though I did have this career as well that was sometimes <laughs> stressful and crazy. Um, but um, I don't know. You know, my friends asked me, how did you balance it? I, you know, when I look back, I was, I was getting my master's degree at night. I was married. I We had our son. You know, I would read my textbooks, you know, and he'd be next to me reading his book. And then like we'd switch <laughs> uh -huh. and he'd, he'd say, your book isn't fun to read, mom. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I can imagine, you know, it, it, I was fortunate, um, both my husband's family and my family are extremely supportive, very helpful. Um, my mom, she was diagnosed with cancer when I was 34 and that was a shock. She was completely healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, they never found the originating site. So it's, there's a possibility it was breast cancer, but by the time they found it, it was another, it was different. And I had never heard of that either. I actually said to the doctor, I don't even understand how that's possible, but I guess with some cancers, they can't always find the originating site. Um, and, and she, boy, she, she fought, she tried hard. Um, and even when she was going through chemo, she looked like a model. She's she just like, Mom, are you kidding me? Should she, she was, you know, she that's how she was. Um, and she passed away a year later. I was actually wow. next to her and she was home. My dad had taken care of her. Um, and 
I had walked in the bedroom and then, um, I don't know what made me do it, but I crawled into bed with her and I put her in my arms and I said, you know, I didn't know what to say. I was the only one that didn't read the hospice booklet, mm -hmm. but I knew from like watching TV, you're not supposed to say stay. And I just instinctively said, you know, we'll take care of each other mm -hmm. and everybody will be, well, we weren't going to be okay, but <laughs> I said, we'll be okay. And then she passed away in my arms and that was, that was hard. That was, that took a long time to, um, to walk through. You, you don't get over it. You walk through. Um, but then one day I thought, you know, I would think I was skiing and I thought, you know, I want to think about her in positive mm -hmm. uh, times. And so I just started talking and um, I, instead of crying, I was smiling and uh, laughing and, and then it was okay to keep going mm -hmm. after that. But I think about her every day, you know, she just, she's the type of person that could make you laugh. She was <laughs> the type of person that would make you feel you were the most important person in the room. And um, that's a gift. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, those are huge. Parents passing are huge obstacles. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And can, and can give you that sense of like, I'm, I give up, you know, or, mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately we also have this, this concept of oh if that happened to mom it's going to happen to me mm -hmm. and in your case you are dealing with a, a situation where it is a little bit of a mystery as to what's going on with the atypical um cells there in your breast mm -hmm. tissue so the atypical ductal hyperplasia can you explain to us a little bit about the diagnosis and kind of when that came about and how that might have impacted a little bit of how you move forward and how you're looking at aging going forward. Give us, give us a scoop of what went in your, around in your head in that one. Sure. So um, I've always felt it very important to keep up with all of your appointments and your doctors. And we have moved a few times. And so that's a little bit of a challenge, but I definitely always kept up like with mammograms and annual exams and things like that. I think I had my first mammogram when I was 35. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a very good doctor in Michigan and, um, and I, over the years, you know, they would find something, but and it was like, no, don't worry about it. And, but then the whole thing, concept of dense breasts came about. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, probably two years ago, I had a mam, I never, I had a mammogram in Houston. And when the results came back, and I also had a pelvic exam. And when the results came back, it said atypical cells on my pelvic exam. And I thought, mm, what's that? Just because this, my, you know, with my mom, right? In my background, right. in my head. Right. So I asked the doctor, and she's a very good doctor. I asked her, and um, the answer kind of, I don't know, it just, it didn't settle right. And that's another thing I also speak with my aunt about. It's like, you know what? You didn't go to medical school, but you know your body. Mm -hmm. You really have to you know, ask the doctor for their advice. So I, the answer I got back just didn't sit well. And so I was referred to MD Anderson in Houston and I went and they said, you, it is atypical. And apparently when you reach postmenopausal women, reach a certain age, you might get a atypical result and a pap smear. Mm -hmm. But because of my history, I was at not, there was no risk factors involved. Um, and so they just said, you don't have to worry. And I'm like, well, okay. I mean, you know, two doctors and MD Anderson is probably one of the best places in the world. Right. But the woman, the gynecologist said, Lynn, you're due for your mammograms. Did you know we can do them here? And I'm like, well, I don't have. I don't have cancer. And they said, no, we have a whole wellness area. So by the grace of God, I went and, you know, I think their technology is probably the best, right? Mm. And they found um, something. So it was a cyst. And mm -hmm. they said that they wanted to do um, a, bio a fine needle biopsy, which I had had one in Michigan years ago. So I said, okay. So we did it. And when you're at there, they test it right away. They 
they don't have you leave. You still lay there. They take oh, the wow. sample. Yeah. And a woman came in from the lab, got it. And they came back and they said, um, that was benign. And I was like, <laughs> thank you. Um, they said, however, we see some uh, cells that are suspicious. And I'm like, what? And, and I said, is it like a cyst? And they said, no, it's like, it's not one, it's just cells. And they said, for that, you need to come back and have a core biopsy. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. And so um, my husband drove me for that because they give you some medicine. And I don't know if you've ever had that or your listeners have ever had. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So you go in, you know, you in your gown, you lay down on this table and there's a hole in it for your breasts mm -hmm. to go through. Mm -hmm. They lift the table up and they go under the table. Uh, they are sit on a chair and they go under the table and um, they take the cells, same thing, you know, they, and then I was like, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm getting an oil change. I'm like, oh <laughs> and it does hurt even though they numb you, it hurt a lot. Like I felt like somebody's stabbing me. Not that I, anyway, a top doctor came in and kind of patted my back and said, you're doing great. You're doing great. And you can't move at all because that could affect it. Anyway, they, that they came back and they, afterward they wrap you in this tight wrap. And then they say, they came back and they said, you have these atypical ductal, hyperplasia cells and we recommend that you go on an estrogen blocker mm -hmm. um and for because you're postmenopausal, we recommend that you go on this well there were a couple choices but they told me the one that they recommended was a certain one mm -hmm. and so i started that actually on my birthday last year gotcha. <laughs> a year ago gotcha. so Wow. Um, you, you just take it every day. And there are side effects that you have to watch out for, like blood clots um, um, and some other side effects. Wow. Has had you had any symptoms at all, like any breast tenderness or even like through menopause and going through perimenopause? Did you have hot flashes? Did you have any symptoms at all? No. So wow. my um, I started my period, I think, when I was about 14. So it was a little bit later than most of my friends. And then I ended it at 54. And I really didn't have any of that. And so when you're the interesting thing, this this estrogen blocker, it really doesn't block it. It because yeah. it you're still at risk, but it greatly reduces the risk. I had to, I've had hot flashes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, this is horrible. All my uh, friends that went through this. Um, that's part of it that one of the other symptoms. So yeah, this has been fun. <laughs> <laughs> now, now you're getting your taste of what the rest of the folks were going through. Mm -hmm. Oh goodness. Oh goodness. You yeah. know, it's, it's wild to think, you know, and I think a lot of people don't really realize that we can have atypical cells. You know, we think about it cervix, right? And we think about mm -hmm. it down below, but we don't think about it in terms of breast tissue. And, and I'm glad that you're sharing that. And I definitely wanted folks to hear about that. And yes, breast MRIs, even when they put you into the machine, you're down, like you're getting your oil change. They put you in the tube just as much as getting a biopsy. It is weird. It's absolutely weird. And, and you're right. Not we, before we hit record guys, we were talking about not a lot of people talk about that. And, mm -hmm. and it's a weird, it's a weird experience as, as a whole. But the, the good news is, is it seems like for now things are staying stable as of your last checkup. Yes. So grateful. Um, so I've had, so now I'm on a schedule where you have an MRI, a breast exam and an MRI six months later, um, a breast exam and a mammogram, and then six months later. So I just had my second MRI um, and then I had a mammogram in between. So I've had three follow-ups and it's a friend of mine who had breast cancer. I remember I worked with her and I, I didn't even know she had it. It's incredible. And she said, those appointments are the worst day of your life and the best day. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, because you go in and you're so worried, but then you come out and you like find out <laughs> you're good. See you in six months. And um, yeah, so 
there is definitely some some relief in knowing and and I think that's important for folks to hear that like testing mm -hmm. you know in in certain cases having the testing whatever it may be you know just knowing having that peace of mind because I think we can work ourselves into some things too if we're if we don't know the answer I I find that true very true and I have friends um quite a few who've had breast cancer um and some are very you know, they they go to every appointment. And then I've had friends that they're very nervous to go back. Mm -hmm. And I, I understand both approaches. My approach is just as always been, I'd rather know, I'd rather know. I, I want to know because then I can make a plan. And from that, you know, we can go forward. And in fact, um, um, someone had mentioned to me a book, um, I think the title's breast and I, it's like dog eared and, you know, it's a, <laughs> a gynecologist out in um, California that wrote it. It's an excellent book. I, and um, yeah, I'm just trying, I'm drinking a lot green tea <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, again, I think that whole thing about like incorporating mindfulness um, and trying to calm your, your, yourself down it's a little like being in the starting gate of a ski race which is um because in as you know with playing sports your your heart just starts you know your adrenaline kicks in and you just start going and so um you have to focus breathe and be ready to to go you know isn't it fascinating how our sports as when we're younger, and, and I think even as as we're older, if you have a coach, if you start getting into something, you can really use that same, you know, mm -hmm. foundation for a lot of obstacles in, mm -hmm. in life. Now, not only and this is something, of course, I want folks to hear too, not only have you had the, the breast diagnosis, and you're working with that, you've had three traumatic brain injuries. So guys, three TBIs too. And, mm -hmm. and she's still moving forward here. Now, Unfortunately, the last one was doing something you absolutely love and skiing in the, in the mountains. Let's let's talk a little bit. I, I want to turn it positive, of course, because, you know, we want to keep keep the positive vibe, but also educate at the same time. You took a quarter break um, in in your life and, and you went to to teach in Deer Valley, correct? Did I get that? Yes. Right? Yes. I'm Tell us ski school. Tell us about that teaching. Ski school. You know, because a lot of people will think, you know, when I was 20. I don't even know. I think I was like 22, 20, I don't even know how old it was. I was like, I wanted to ski, teach ski school, you know, and I'm going to go do it now because if I, if I wait till I'm older, I can't couch surf um, and do it. So give us the scoop about making the decision to go teach ski school old, when you're older and how, how that all looks and, and even having the two traumatic brain injuries prior to that, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of people would be like, Oh, I don't know. So give us the scoop right. on that. Right. Um. So I never took a gap year after college and got married. We started our family, started working, Was went to school at night to get my master's degree. So uh, fast forward to um, our my mid-50s, I had an opportunity. I was done with an, one assignment and I wasn't starting another assignment because by then I was freelancing. So I just finished an assignment with Facebook. And um, so I just kind of put everything on hold and it was kind of spur of the moment, but we decided to go up to Deer Valley and, and we were just going to ski for like the week. And then my husband jokingly got a job and I'm like, well, now what am I going to do? Like, he's like, well, just go ski. You've always wanted to ski. And I'm like, I can't ski seven days a week. <laughs> so the next day I went to the ski school and um, got a job. And of course, I don't do it like two days a week. I do it five days a week. And then in my off days, I ski. Um and it, oh my gosh, I had a blast. I just <laughs> smiled. It was so much fun and um, was with the little kids and telling knock knock jokes and just, <laughs> just, you know, just making them that Deer Valley has a saying of the Deer Valley experience and they're very proud of it. They want to give every guest, they want every guest to just have a great time, have fun. So you go up and that fit with my previous experience working in advertising, taking care of clients. Um, and so I did that. And um, on the off season, I, uh, I mean, on the weekends, I went free skiing 
to places like Alta and nice. doing double black diamonds and things like that, which, you know, I grew up ski racing, so um, it was fun, but um, it, the challenges of the TBIs right after I had them, because one was falling out of a truck in 2014 and then in 2015 being in a car accident, I did have all of the typical symptoms. Um, and that you can see in the MRI where uh, my left temporal lobe was damaged, mm. um, it, which I did have some testing done and that showed executive function and working memory challenges and also a hearing loss in my right ear um, from, um, the car accident that I was in. Um, but the good news is with that, I can get a hearing aid and because it's not like you're getting old hearing loss, it's like, um, you know, damaged. Mm -hmm. So, um, but no, I just went up to Deer Valley and had a great time. I just, I smiled every day. It was so much fun. And, um, um, and then went back into the corporate world for a while. Um, and then fast forward to this past year was skiing again, and it was nobody's fault, but somebody came into me and they didn't realize, I'm not sure how, but whatever they, they were pulling me and I was like, Hey, Hey, but I don't think I was yelling loud enough because with my hearing aid or hearing issue, I always feel like I'm yelling inside my head but other people say I'm soft-spoken. So I was being dragged. I slammed backwards on the hard snow and um, I got another concussion and um, a TBI. I was nauseated um, and um, same, same exact same pain that I had had before. Um, and um, I also had whiplash mm. from it. So um that led me to being evaluated and going through PT. And actually I'm going through some PT right now, um, both for um, physical PT for balance, but they've also said that I could, um, I qualify for, um, they call it speech physical therapy. Mm. And I'm like, okay, well, I was stuttering right after the car accident and I couldn't find words. Like I would know that, you know, an object was a, um, a glass, you put water in it, but I couldn't come up with the word glass mm. or like in the movie finding Alice, I think is her name or still Alice, the movie mm. it's based on a book. She, um, goes to an area campus and she doesn't know where she's at. That happened to me coming out of a store. I had no idea how I got there, who I was with, why, like, and it was a store that I'd been to, you know, for years. Mm -hmm. Um, and then even when she's doing her speech with the marker, mm -hmm. um, I had to do that when I was presenting at work. Oh, wow. But wow. I didn't, I hadn't seen that movie until at, years later. So I just found ways to compensate. Um, and, um, with the speech PT, they'll also do cognitive PT. So, Yeah. That's good to know. I think a lot of people don't realize that if they've had a concussion, that there's actually physical therapists now who are geared towards helping folks to to recover. Did you take any supplements? Did you eat differently? Did you do anything in that realm of things to help you recover as well? Yes, definitely. Um, definitely change. Um, well, I never really ate like greasy food or anything like that, but definitely was trying to eat food for um, my brain. I think so fortunate that my doctor in Michigan after the car accident said, uh, I was back there visiting and he said, eat as much healthy fats as your brain can stand. So like avocados, like just olive oil, everything that will help. And so I did that. Um, I took supplements that would help. Um, and, um, uh, I don't drink much caffeine when I was working. I was probably drinking like six cups of coffee a day <laughs> just because, you know, you have to be creative constantly. And um, uh, so I drink maybe one, two cups of coffee tops. Uh, I I had stopped drinking alcohol for about 20 years when my kids were little. Um, mm -hmm. Just didn't want to be in that situation. 
in the business that I was in because I saw a lot of people um, have trouble with it. And um, but then when we moved to Austin and I fell out of the the truck onto um, the cement backwards, and so I slammed my head and my back onto the cement. Um, alco having alcohol was like in. I found out later why, but, and I didn't understand why, but it just felt like my brain was on fire full mm -hmm. of inflammation. And apparently that's exactly what it is. And so a lot of people, after they have uh, TBI, um, they stop drinking because it just, it doesn't, um, your brain actually hurts, you know? And what was happening to me is that um, I was getting very tired and so I'd go to my car at lunch and sleep. Oh, wow. And they explained it as your brain was shutting down. And so your body just would. And even to, even now, um, like family will be like, oh, you you're like you're like when you're tired, you are tired. You it's like lights out, you know, and I do have a problem with there, if there's a big group of people talking, I'm kind of like a. A squirrel yeah. like I can't, <laughs> I can't follow the conversation, which was a challenge in my job because you can imagine being in a creative um, industry mm -hmm. where you're in multiple screens up at one time. And the doctor said, you can do like one thing at a time. That's it. You can't have like a Excel spreadsheet open, a PowerPoint, listening to somebody mm -hmm. on a you know, that's your brain. It's overload. Can't handle that. So that I had to come to grips with, <laughs> you know, like, oh, okay. Maybe there's some stuff I can't do. <laughs> well, and that's a, you know, you, so anyway, that's how I kind of pivoted into this other area of writing. Mm -hmm. And um, that's been fun. Do you feel Very like, fun. Do you feel like pivoting into writing has helped you to be more mindful and, and work on meditation and kind of helping you to kind of focus your energy towards towards your work that way? A hundred percent. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's um, when I graduated from school uh, from high school it was 1980. Uh, you know, there weren't a lot of jobs. Um, I was fortunate somebody took my resume into an ad agency in Michigan because I didn't know anybody that worked in advertising. And so I got a job and, um, and then, um, uh, the focus though, at that time, I actually almost became a packaging major, <laughs> <laughs> not because I like packaging, but because you could make a lot of money. Yeah. It, yeah. There was nothing about be happy in your career. It was go out and make, start making money, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think it's really cool that younger people today are going, yeah, no, I don't want to do that. Like, I want to be happy from the start. It's probably because they saw all of us being crazy. Right? <laughs> do, you, you know? do you think that folks, you know, I mean, my age group too, go out and make money, figure, find a job that's going to make you money. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of what I learned from my parents. It's what's kind of the programming, you know, that we all had when we were younger. Do you feel like if you would have started out your career, um, doing something that you would have loved, do you think that things would have been different or do you think it, this was your mission anyway, your life turned out as you wanted it to anyway? Uh, yeah, you know, my my life would have been different. I was actually in the hotel and restaurant program at Michigan State, which was other than I think Cornell was like one of the best ones at the time. I think it still is. And um, so I was taking a lot of business class. I had like four economics classes, but then I also had like a cooking class. <laughs> it's <laughs> crazy. Um, and then my dad came to visit me. We went out um, and he just said, you know, Lynn, wouldn't you rather be the person that had visits the resorts rather than works at the resort. And <laughs> the reason he said that was because he was thinking, eventually, if you ever decide to have a family, how are you going to do those hours at a resort, which is typically weekends. And the, the funny part, though, working advertising is you work a gazillion hours because <laughs> 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 I switched my major over to advertising. And um, 
so my life definitely would have been different. Um, you know, but, um, I don't regret the way that it, I mean, I think it's, it's definitely been an adventure and a lot of fun. And I've met great people along the way that I've still stayed friends with. Um, but it, you know, the career, it was a little mixture, kind of like if you take that show Mad Men and <laughs> with A Devil Wears Prada, the book, <laughs> with the morning show. I mean, that was kind of every day you walk in, it's just chaos, you know. Um, so I just tried to remain very calm in the chaos and uh, set goals and really learn to be very, very productive because I did have young kids at home. Which is a juggle for everyone. I mean, it, mm -hmm. that's that's raising kids or taking care of parents, depending on which phase you are in life. So, Lynn, how young are you right now? 61. All right. I was hoping that you would tell me, and it, of course, we had talked about it a little bit earlier. I want folks to hear, like, she's 61. She's driven Formula race car, you know, Formula and race car. She's skied. She's, I'm sure you're still skiing, even though mm -hmm. I, I don't know about the ski situation in Texas. Are there good ski? No. <laughs> are, there, are there any ski resorts in Texas? I don't even know. Are there even mountains in Texas? I probably no. should know this. I didn't. Well, think so. you can go down the Big Bend, which is kind of like the Texas Grand Canyon, but there's not snow down there. So when uh, my husband was transferred to Austin, I said, "Okay, cool," but I'm getting a ski pass, <laughs> and so I have the Icon ski pass. So we normally go. I mean, I've been been fortunate to be at pretty much every resort in the country but we typically go to like utah or colorado so what are, um, so is deer valley one of your favorite ski resorts still after having worked there oh yeah the the <laughs> they are uh they were incredible um as far as like a place to work people to work with the bosses I, I think the ownership has changed but they're still it's still first class Another area that I like to go right around, it's on another canyon across. It's called Alta. Mm -hmm. And when you're at Alta, you just think you must be in heaven because it's just, it's uh, probably the Deer Valley and Alta are probably the best snow on earth, um, in my nice. opinion. Yeah. Nice. And so, of course, the competition in Colorado then over the border there. Now, now. <laughs> Where in Colorado is your favorite place to ski? What's your favorite resort there? Uh, I was fortunate to go to Vail when I was 17, and that was just mind-blowing. Um, so Vail is great, Aspen, Snowmass. Um, I love Breckenridge. Um, I had an opportunity to ski at Telluride. Um, they're, I mean, but they're all great. They're incredible. Yeah, yeah. they're yeah. just incredible. Um Veil at 17. That had yeah. been really neat because it was before all of the big, mm -hmm. you know, blow up of all of the resorts. And mm -hmm. at that time, so ooh, I'm jealous. I wish I could have experienced that. Back yeah. Then. I remember we had dinner at Pepe's by the watchtower, and then we went downstairs and Howard Head was there. Oh. <laughs> the owner of the head, the founder of the yeah. head skis. Yeah. It's just a different, different time. And I remember I'm meeting an instructor and he thought I was in racing in college at that point, nice. um, which I did end up racing in college. I mean, I was still in high school, but I did end up racing in college. Um, and it was a, um, it was not a varsity sport at Michigan state. Um, and um, so we had to raise our own money. We coached ourselves, but we qualified the girls team, women's team qualified for the NCAAs of ski racing. Nice. Yeah. Nice. And that was just such a thrill. Um, we showed up, we were like bad news bears though. We, showed, <laughs> we had like sweatshirts for our uniforms and, you know, all these other people had the one piece suits and coaches and massages and yeah. You know, but you know just... what? We still, we still placed and we placed respectable. So yeah, we, we just do it differently in the Midwest. Exactly. <laughs> That's how it works. That's how it works. <laughs> We know how to ski on ice. We don't need all mm -hmm. the big powder. And, you know, that's one of the things that that I, I find, you know, just interesting. When someone tells me they learned how to ski in the Midwest, I'm like, well, you're going to be great. And in, in the mountains, you get you tackle mm -hmm. the powder. You're great. Exactly. You know how to ski on ice. <laughs> right. Exactly. No turning. You don't turn on ice. You just go over it. But people are too afraid. So they try to turn and then they catch an edge and go flying. 
But you see the ice, just be a toboggan and go straight. <laughs> Very, very wise lesson. Very wise lesson. So, of course, Lynn, I want to know what's next for you. What What's on What's on your bucket list? What haven't you done yet? What do you got planned this year? Are you skiing this year? Because you know, as we're recording this, it's December, folks. So, I got to I got to know what our skiing agenda is and uh, what's next for you. So, um, I will be skiing. I have a new helmet. They said throw the other helmet away because it could have micro cracks, and so I have a helmet that has concussion padding in it. Nice. Um, I probably will be careful or maybe even not even go down the double blacks, although I was hit on the top of a blue. So <laughs> go figure. Um, but, um, yeah, I definitely am going to go skiing. Um, my husband and I are talking about possibly doing a long distance bike ride from, um, Texas to Arizona. Um, not sure about that. We'll see about that. And then um, I might possibly start, um, I don't know, we'll see. I have an idea for a book. And so I may, um, I put some thoughts down and there's been some interest. So we'll see, maybe do that. Um, and then I'd also like to get back to traveling again. Um, we were fortunate to be able to go over to Europe and to South America. So um maybe do that um, and maybe incorporate a ski trip in possibly. But the, and then the other thing is I also picked up playing tennis again. Nice. Um, yeah. But the, I, I did find out cause I was like, wow, I think, I think my reaction time has slowed down. And you know, is that part of aging? Like, you know, and I know it is, but actually my physical therapist told me that there's a delay on my eyes from the concussion so I can go from like, say one letter to another, but I don't quite get all the way over to the letter. Gotcha. Like I, I get partway and I, it's sock leads or something. Anyway, I can, I can practice. Good news is I can practice the six times a day for a couple minutes at a time and I can improve. So. Um, Huge. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. Those, those saccades are important doing, doing those types of, of, of therapies. I think it's important for folks to have heard this in terms of you you see that there's a little bit of a slowdown and you you yes we're instantly going to think oh is it age <laughs> but you didn't give up and say oh it's just age you went and looked and asked questions and and yeah. further and that's that's huge I did I did uh, I asked her that and um uh I asked about my balance um because basically the right side of the body, my body got kind of crushed. Um, and I lean to the right. So there's balance, um, uh, exercises I can do. Although when I get on the, what's that, um, thing, it's like a half a ball with the, oh, the BOSU ball. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> is there an earthquake under me? What's going on? Um, so I always have to make sure a wall is close by but you can you can also do that to improve over time and then um um the friend that uh, i played tennis with she said you're not a you're not a beginner like you're you're you know you can do this again and so i'm gonna she gave me the name of a coach and i'm gonna call her and um try to set up some lessons so awesome awesome yeah. no that's huge the muscle memory is there the muscle memory is there. Exactly. And if you look at most tennis players as they're older, they all, for the most part, they're all really fit. Mm -hmm. And that's my goal. I want to stay fit. My dad, uh, he was playing golf three times a week and uh, up until his nine, he was 90 when he passed away. Um, and he was playing in, up until four months before he passed away. And he was winning tournaments, you know, for the whole club, not just his age group. So, um, I know he'd be, you know, he's passed away about five years now, but he, he'd be smiling right now <laughs> for sure. My mom would be too. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So. Absolutely. No doubt. No doubt. So Lynn, before we wrap up completely, I want to just have you impart some wisdom on folks. If there's one thing you could tell someone who's going, am I getting older and do I need to slow down? Do I need to 
to just, you know, give up on some of my bucket list things I haven't tried, what would you say to them? What would be your your parting words or your inspiring words to someone who's just like, I'm not sure about what to think about getting older? You know, I think it obviously it's physical, but it is definitely a mindset. And, um, you know, I want to, I want to be around for my kids and their families. And, you know, I think if you can find something, we hear this all the time, but find something you enjoy, whether it's, you know, dancing or Zumba or, you know, um, yoga or what, you know, just the key is to move. So many people just don't seem to move. Um, and I think too, as you get older, like, uh, weight training is important. Um, you know, balance exercises. So I think that, you know, the, the great news is we have so many options now you can pull up a YouTube video, you know, you can do, uh, classes with friends and I, it's just, you know, it really affects not just your body, but your, but your overall happiness and your mind. And yeah, you'll have setbacks, but you have setbacks when you're younger mm -hmm. and, you know, and, you know, I kind of did do the, oh, is it getting, am I getting older? Cause you know, my reaction time is slow, but you know, your body. So go ask the experts and ask them say, you know, Hey, you know, I'm noticing this about myself, but, um, and okay, maybe I can't run, you know, a uh, a 5k anymore, but I can bike ride, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, I can't bike ride on my bike, but I can get one of those e-bikes, mm -hmm. um, you mm -hmm. know, like there's so much now or, um, you know, this type of hit classes just don't work for me anymore because I don't want to carry a tire down the block, <laughs> but you know what? I can get a kayak. Yep. Yeah. You know, um, so, um, you know, I think just finding ways to adapt and, um, keep me, keep moving forward. Absolutely. You know, I, I, you move forward. I think you'll be okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Sage advice. I love it. I love it. I think everyone's going to be able to take a little nugget away from that. Now, of course, You've got some social media, you've got Instagram, you've got LinkedIn. Let's tell folks where they can find you and keep tabs on all of your adventures and find out when when and if this book's coming out. Sure. Um, so yeah, I, I have this idea for a book. Um, I have a woman that I've been working with. Her name's Allison Lane. She's been fantastic and um, helping me guide me to put the book proposal together. I don't have a title. Um, it's, um, but, um, uh, hopefully this year I can, um, get it sent out to the agents because, uh, what I didn't know with a book, you don't write the book first. <laughs> mm -hmm. I thought you did. You only write like some summaries and some other things. So I have to put it together and, uh, hopefully get it to them this year. And then, um, you know, it depends. I don't know how fast the publishing actually happens, but, um, definitely have some fun stories to tell that I think people would laugh about um, some wild times in my career. So <laughs> um, yeah. And then uh, I'm on Instagram, Elmerose seven uh, on Instagram. And then you can find me on LinkedIn with my name and I can give you the information if you want to post it too. Yeah, we definitely want to put that in the podcast notes at drjkrausnd.com. And so for LinkedIn, is it Lynn, L-Y-N-N, and then Moroz, M-R-O-Z? Yes. Okay, yeah. perfect. Mr. Oz, if you can't Mr. remember my last name. <laughs> we talked about that. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, if anybody wants to reach out and they're involved in sports and want to, want to do something, let me know. Because um, I'm on a Facebook group, Women, Women Who Ski, and we're always doing fun stuff. Oh, goodness. Dang, I wish we would have talked about that. But we'll make sure we get that in the podcast notes at drjkrausnd.com because I, I like the idea of women who ski because I am one, of course. Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> nevertheless, Lynn, thank you so much for volunteering to come on and chat with me. I sincerely appreciate it. Oh, thank you. This has been terrific. Thank <laughs> you so pleasure. much. All right. Hey, Health Junkies, Dr. Janine Krause here. I am looking for some help from you all. And what I'm looking for is some inspiration, some inspirational stories that I can share of men and women defying aging. 
and defying it by crossing things off their bucket list that maybe they thought they could never do. Maybe coming back from an injury, starting something new, like skiing at 40 years old. Whatever it may be, I want to know about these stories and I want to interview folks. Maybe it's you, maybe it's someone you know. Doesn't matter. I want to help inspire folks out there that you don't have to follow social aging norms. You can defy stuff. You can get better as you get older. You can make so much progress at any age. You can build muscle at any age. You can have a stronger heart at any age. And you can crush all those things you want to do on your bucket list. Just because you're older doesn't mean you have to give up on yourself and your dreams. And this is something that I want to share and inspire folks with. And so if you have a story or someone you know, email us at info at doctor spelled out. So D-O-C-T-O-R-J-K-R-A-U-S-E-N-D dot com. Let's spread the word about how amazing life can be as you get older and all the cool things that you can do. All right. 